Hello, friends. I want to let you know about a couple of events that I'm hosting on the LGBTQ conversation in Santa Clarita and then again in San Diego in California. Uh, The Santa Clarita event is October 16th and 17th, and the San Diego event is uh, October 19th and 20th. Uh, These are two um, different events. One is an evening conversation where we sort of introduce the LGBTQ conversation. And then the following day in both cities, we do a full day uh, training for church leaders. Uh, Again, on the LGBTQ conversation, we dig into theology, relationships, uh, pastoral ministry questions. We hear uh, testimonies from various people. um, It's a time when we can come together and uh, think deeply, love widely, dig into both truth and grace in what has become some of the most pressing questions facing the church today. Uh, to find out more about these two events, you can go to centerforfaith.com, uh, go to the events link, and you can find all the info there again, October 16th to the 17th in Santa Clarita, and then the 19th and 20th in San Diego. If you cannot make it out to California, or if you don't live anywhere near these cities, you can also stream these events uh, live online. Again, centerforfaith.com. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology and Ram. My guest today is Dr. Benjamin E. Reynolds, who is a professor of New Testament and chair of the Department of Biblical Studies and Theology at Tyndale University in Canada. He he received his PhD from University of Aberdeen in Scotland, where I also did my degree. In fact, we became good friends uh, when we're studying for our PhDs at Aberdeen University. Um, He is a specialist in the Gospel of John, specifically the concept of the Son of Man, when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Uh, it's a huge debate within scholarship what exactly Jesus is talking about there. So we get into that a bit towards the end of this podcast, but I asked Ben to come on and just give us a good kind of theological entry point into John's gospel. That took us in, into many different uh, passages and themes and discussions around various things, especially in the early chapters of John. So uh, get your Bibles open and get ready to dive into good John's gospel with the one and only Dr. Benjamin Reynolds. Ben, thanks so much for coming on The Elgin Raw. This is the first time I've had you on. I can't believe this is like almost insulting that it's taken me this long to have you on. That's <laughs> oh, all right. It's great to be here, Preston. It's always, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. So uh, Ben and I, we go all the way back to our Aberdeen days. We did our PhDs under... Um, we had the same advisor, Simon Gathercole, who's now at Cambridge, and uh, um, we were both studying New Testament, but uh, I was studying Paul, you were studying John, so we were basically right. in two different worlds. I know it's shocking for people to hear, like, you're both studying the New, not just the Bible, but like the New Testament, and our research didn't overlap at all. Like, there was no, like... <laughs> no, the- I think what we had in common is we were, had a similar interest in Second Temple Judaism and its relationship to the New Testament. Um, and I, we we got together sometimes and we yeah. share papers back and forth with our other friend, uh, Joey Dotson, and they, he was also a Pauline scholar. So sometimes yeah. they would get into these conversations. <laughs> you, guys, you guys would get into these conversations, and I would be so lost. I'd be like staring off into space, and you're in this Pauline detail. Like, uh, when are we going to get back to John? Yeah, we used to get together. Uh, yeah, we, we called it PB and J, Preston, Ben, and Joey. We get together at that little pub in that underground, the illicit still. Do you remember that? It's not there anymore. Oh, yeah. I was back there. Um, I was in Aberdeen last year, and and it doesn't. It's gone. It's just so sad. It was like the coolest little. It's like almost like a cave, like underneath the building, and it was just yeah. dark. And we get together and like read paper or we read read stuff ahead of time. They kind of give feedback yeah, and, and stuff. Chat, chat about it. Yeah, I was yeah. just back in Aberdeen in May. I I didn't go looking for it, but uh, <laughs> had a good time being back. Well, wait, you're there in May. I was there. Wait, yeah. When was I there? Oh no, no, I was there. Like, gosh, it was almost a year ago now. Yeah. What were you doing? In the, were you giving a paper? Or? No, we we went to we went to a, a wedding actually. Oh no. And so then we took some time to visit friends because there's a few few people who were studying with us that are still in the area doing oh, wow. uh, pastoral work or or various other things. They're friends from our church. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Well, let's talk about John. I, I wanted you to come on and and. Uh, yeah, walk us through John, primarily because John is, it's one of those books that I feel like, you know, when Christians are told to start reading the Bible, it's like, well, you start with John. I don't, John, to me, John's, I used to do that, but after reading, 
John's kind of complicated to me. I'm like, I don't know if I'd start there. Maybe start with like Mark or something. Or, um, but so you know, John's is one of the more familiar books of the Bible to early Christians, and yet having studied it on a PhD level, you've probably appreciated some of the complexity and stuff. So, in, in where, where I I where I want to oh, get. Yeah. Where I want to get is this whole theme of um, apoc- apocalyptic and John. Most people, when they hear apocalyptic, they think Daniel, Revelation. They, the average person typically doesn't think John, but that's kind of your primary world is seeing how apocalyptic thought is integrated in, in John's work, if that's even the right way to put it. But uh, let's start with just let's, – let's go 101, first of all, with John, and then we'll go 201, and we'll dive deeper into some of these themes related to apocalyptic and Son of Man. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, there's that there's that classic phrase. It shows up in a number of places. I don't even remember who first said it, but the Gospel of John is shallow enough for a baby to walk in, huh. but deep enough for an elephant to swim in. Huh. So that that sort of gets at that idea you were talking about. How oh yeah, this is good for an, a first person to read, uh, but then but then there's still so much more to learn about it. But I do, I do think some people first get lost if they if they get into it. And if you think about it, it's sort of that that broad that that huge cosmological opening, right? Mm. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, he was with God in the beginning, and that that just starts very different than than the other Gospels. You know, Mark and Matthew just sort of jump jump right into things in a way. Matthew has his genealogy. Luke has his very literary sort of opening. Hmm. Uh, Mark just cuts to the chase and says, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah. All right, let's get going. Yeah. Uh, but John has this much longer entry. And and uh, the first part of John's gospel, John 1, 1 to 18 or 1 to 17, depending on how you want to measure that off, has traditionally been called the prologue mm-hmm. of John's gospel. And that is a huge debated issue within scholarship these days about whether or not um, that is original. There are a number of scholars that have thought that that was added later, mm-hmm. and the gospel more or less started with this is the testimony of John the Baptist in verse 19. There's no textual manuscripts that indicate that, but but that's been a, a Johannine scholarship idea that has, has been around since uh, critical scholarship in the 19th century. Did Pete Williams, I thought he, did he kind of, oh, yeah. put, he didn't yeah, put that he, to death, but he dealt it a significant blow by arguing that this is, there's no evidence for this not being part of the original. Oh yeah. I, as far as I'm concerned, he, he, <laughs> he, he dealt a blow to, to that view. Um, but I was at a conference last fall where I, I brought Pete's work up and said, Hey, because mm. the whole conference was on the prologue. Oh, I, wow. said, I don't know if we should really be thinking about it this way because of the way, because Pete went into various manuscripts yeah. from the second, third, fourth century and showing that there's no paragraphing actually between 118 and 119 in the early manuscripts. Mm-hmm. Some of the earliest paragraphing you see between 15 and 16. Okay. And then, and then in even in ancient liturgical texts, like what was read in, in churches, mm-hmm. there was, there was always a break. It seems like at 117. Okay. So 118 would be the beginning of the next section. And 118 says, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And this is the testimony of John when he sent Jew, when Jews sent priests. Okay. So uh, that, if you, if you read it in that way, it kind of tra- sort of changes your focus about what's actually at stake here. And it's the, the one, no one has seen God. But then the question is, well, who, ha- is there someone who's seen God? Oh, okay. And John's gospel actually goes on to say, yes, there's only one who has seen God, and that's the one who came from God in the first place. Ah, so yeah. so you have this, this so it's kind of highlighting your what you're getting at with the apocalyptic piece, but it's this revelatory aspect that John's gospel has hmm. in that it's saying the only one who can see God or the only one who makes God possible to be seen is the one who's come from God in the first place. And that is Jesus, the Messiah. Hmm. So that's the one you need to follow because he becomes the vision of God on earth. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So prologue, you're going to say part of the original, not going to question that. Um, what, what, what's the theological function of the prologue? Like, how does this, like, why does John begin it this way? Well, you, you've got, um, well, see that 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 gets into some of my thinking about about John's relationship to the idea of revelation. 
I, I understand apocalyptic as revelatory things that are mm-hmm. revealed because when, when you look at and Daniel and the revelation are our, our two key texts that we think about when we think about apocalypses, those are the only two apocalypses that are in the, in the Bible. Mm-hmm. There are numerous Jewish apocalypses outside the Bible, like first Enoch, fourth Ezra, second Baruch. There's a, there's a long series of these. And most of these are either written before the, the, the New Testament texts, mm-hmm. and some of them are written sort of simultaneously or slightly after. And Revelation and, and Daniel, as I like to tell my students, if you read those two texts alongside these other texts, they're not that weird. If you, <laughs> yeah. if you read the Daniel and Revelation alongside other texts in the Bible, yeah, they're weird. But, okay. but when you see them against these other texts, like, no, this is a fairly standard sort of genre of literature from this time period in okay. which things of heaven are revealed, angels, God but then also some of what God plans to do, what's going to happen to the righteous and the wicked hmm. in the present and in the future. So those are things that, that are happening. So in, I think John has this relationship with, with that sort of literature. And I, I have, and I argued in a recent book that I think there's a good possibility that the gospel of John was written after revelation. Oh, so and that, and I'm not the first person to say this. There's a long tradition of this in the history of the church. It's a, it's a minority report, but, <laughs> but there are people who have thought this. And for me, that understanding helps me see, okay, if well, Revelation was written first, so if you have someone or a community, if you hold the single authorship, this works. If you hold the community authorship, I think this still works. If you if Revelation was written first and you see Jesus as this heavenly exalted figure, and then you rethink the life of Jesus on earth through mm. that lens, John's gospel could be what you end up with. Wow. Hence, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And this here's the Lamb of God with John the Baptist saying this, but well, the Lamb's already been revealed in heaven mm. at the throne, right? So there, there's these possibilities. It's not, I mean, I'm not going to stake everything on that, but to me, it, it makes sense of of this revelatory aspect that we see in John, which is quite different than what we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Do you take uh, the same author for Revelation and the Gospel of John, or no? Because most people, most scholars don't, right? Oh, most scholars don't. They they definitely do not. I, and and I, why why is that? Why? That's a lot. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, just, I, I think most people take it. it brief. Yeah. The, the um, part of the reason is, is one of the arguments is that they, they've been associated just because the name John is associated with the text. And so you, you do have um, the gospel of John traditionally been associating with Ephesus the book of Revelation with the Isle of Patmos. They're not too far away geographically in modern okay. day Turkey. But how does a how does a fisherman from Galilee end up there writing these two texts mm. as someone who's not necessarily lear- a learned, educated person? Okay. Uh, so so that's some of the argument. And then you also you also have some testimony to two Johns or two tombs in Ephesus of a John figure. Oh, right. right? And that goes back to Eusebius and even, um, uh, even uh, I'm going to get my names mixed up, but I think it was Dionysius also argued that the authorship in the second century, second or third century, argued that the authorship was different because the language is very different. So okay. Revelation's Greek is considered very rough right. uh, in comparison to the Gospel of John. Which isn't okay. necessarily like classical Greek by any means, yeah. but there's a there's a difference of style, but there's also a difference of of type of literature, type okay. of vocabulary, right? Okay. So why why do is it just why do people assume the same John Apostle John wrote both? Because there is some language with like logos and other images and stuff that you do see in John and and Revelation, right? Like as much as there's a different genre, different languages. There's also a lot of similarities too, right? Or is that, I haven't really thought through yeah, this too. There, yeah. there are a number of similarities. There's some shared vocabulary between okay. the two of them that only exists between these two texts in the New Testament. 
um, similar sorts of themes, like the idea of eternal life, yeah. the idea of, of shepherding, uh, the use of Jesus, describing Jesus as lamb, even though in Revelation he's called the lamb, but in John he's called the lamb of God, and that's only two times, whereas in Revelation it's 28 times oh, wow. lamb. Uh, you also have Jesus called the word in John's gospel and then the word of God in okay. Revelation 19. So you have a number of similar sorts of themes. Some scholars would argue and just say, well, that's just general Christian theology that's appearing in both. I tend to think they're theologically connected. Okay. But um, there's some there's a study by Jörg Fry that goes into the details of how adjectives are used, how conjunctions are used, and and he argues that 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 sort of wording, which is like a, a fingerprint in some ways on somebody's writing style, they're very different okay. in the way that they're used as far as spelling and, and other things too. So these small details okay. are considered okay. some of the difference, at least for, for York Fry and, and for some others. Okay, and they're saying, well, you could come up with themes and but write write about them differently. I don't know. I I tend, to, I mean, I tend to think that the the early tradition is much closer than we are to it, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm not going to just discount that entirely. Okay, because oh, I'm eighteen year eighteen hundred years away, and I'm I'm smarter. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have to hold all those things together. And to me. It does make sense for single authorship, but that's a very rare opinion. And oh, so world. you so you do think same John wrote both? Yeah, I, it, I, I'm yeah. more willing to to take that view. Okay, uh, to me, it sort of makes sense. I can see the arguments against it, but I'm willing to hold to it. <laughs> you sound like such a scholar. I know. So I'm, I'm hedging my bets. I'm like I'm back at a New Testament seminar. Well, I'm willing to take this view, but I'm not going <laughs> to. All right, let, let's get back to the so so. Um, some good arguments for same John writing both. You say there's a good case to be made that revelation maybe was even written first and then the gospel after yeah. let's get into the theological meat of John's gospel. Like how does, what makes sure. John tick if you will? Yeah. Well, um, a lot of it I think is, is again, it's this revelation of Jesus because, and it's also the, the signs he does. John doesn't refer to miracles. He refers to signs. Hmm. And um, I think, that is a very important thing because of the emphasis also on witness, on believing, on seeing, mm. and and the signs become um, what Boltman talked about as the visible words. So as as Jesus is um, Jesus is the word, but his actions as signs become the visible action or visible reality of the word. And so these signs, they're, they're not just miracles. He's not just doing amazing things. But the point of them is, like any sign, the sign in itself is not important. So I was just on a hike last week with my kids. We get to the, we get to the parking lot. Then there's a sign right at the start of the trail that says, Trailhead begins here, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really care about that sign. We care more about the trail, right, mm -hmm. and where that trail is going to take us. And so the signs in John's Gospel are like are like a signpost that say they're telling us something about Jesus. They're pointing us to Jesus, who again is a, is representing who God the Father is. So, and you have, I mean, it seems that you have seven signs essentially, depending on how you count them. Um, and they're also they're different sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So the water to wine being the first one, which is a um, it's a nature miracle. Right, Jesus is working with nature and he's changing something. He's not healing anybody. But then the second sign is, is the healing, the healing of the uh, the official son, also in Cana. But it's a it's a the the boy is sick, and so he's healed. But then in John five, you have the third sign where you have the lame person who's who is healed. So again, it's a different sort of healing. And then in John six, you have uh, another ma nature miracle with the um, the feeding of the 5,000. So you have the bread and the fish extended. And then the walking on water, which could be considered another 
nature miracle. And, and then we have John nine, the healing of the blind man. Mm -hmm. And then the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. So you have Mm -hmm. a sick person, lame person, blind person, someone who's died and been raised. You have three nature miracles, water to wine, the bread and the fish, and then also the walking on water. So those, um, they're each saying something about who Jesus is. And it's been argued before. You can see that there are, Jesus talks a lot in John's gospel. That's another thing. (laughs) It's pretty chatty. Yeah. Yeah. If you you have a, if you have like a a red letter Bible, it's much more obvious. Like the, the long spaces in which Jesus speaks. (laughs) It's, Whereas if you compare that with Mark, he's just talking for a little short periods of time. Mm-hmm. Or you have Matthew's gospel where he's got these these longer discourses, but they're interspersed by multiple mm-hmm. miracles. Here you almost have the signs interspersed with Jesus' teaching. Mm-hmm. And and the teaching oftentimes is closely associated with the sign. Not always. Sometimes it's a little bit loosely connected. Some scholars have argued that they're all closely connected. But you do have, like, John 6 is a prime example of this connection between the feeding of the 5,000 and then the crowd that comes to follow him the next day where they want more food. And then Jesus um, Jesus quotes the, well, the, the crowd actually quotes the scripture to them in John 6, 31. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then what follows Jesus sort of addresses both parts of that statement that they made, that, that citation. Uh, he, he gave them, and then he argues that it's not, that he is not Moses, but it's God. And it's not a past tense of gave, it's a present tense of give. He gives. The God gives, the Father gives. Uh, and then, and then the, in the latter part, he also deals with the, the bread from heaven. Like its location from heaven, not manna coming down, but Jesus as the bread coming down. So he's the sign then points to this reality of who he is and his coming from heaven and coming to the people. Okay. So is it is there any real quick, is there any significance with you said seven signs, three nature, four with people? Is there any significance why three with nature and why those three with nature? Water to wine. Uh, bread and fish and walking on water um or is it just these are the just yeah is there a logic to why those specific yeah signs? i usually people will talk about the seven as being significant right seven sure. as a number of completion right especially as you see seven is a significant number of revelation mm-hmm. um but then you have others that argue well what uh what about the miraculous catch of fish in john 21 mm. how does the resurrection itself count as a sign um uh. and and then you you also have um reference in um let's see it's John I think it's John 2 Yeah, John 2:23. So it, in John 2:23 to 25, Jesus has already done the water to wine miracle the sign and then he's gone to the temple at, in Jerusalem at Passover, and he has he's done his action in the temple. And then it says in twenty verse twenty three. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Hmm. So at this point, Jesus only one signs recorded. Yeah. But there's a crowd following him because he's done multiple signs. Yeah, plural, the signs. Yeah. So so John, this is one of the things about John's gospel is that, and, and all the gospels really, is that they're presenting specific material to tell something about Jesus. Mm-hmm. So John has picked these signs for some reason. But I, I think, in my view, I just see them as different types of things that he did. You don't get multiple healings of blind people. Okay. You don't get multiple lame healings, multiple resurrections. You've got one of each, and mm-hmm. they're sort of progressive. But as far as the nature miracles are concerned, but all three of those, the water to wine, the feeding of the 5,000, and the walking on water, have been argued to make some connection to God in, in the scriptures mm-hmm. of Israel. 
like wine is a symbol of of the new age uh in some ways the coming of the messiah and the prophets right the the mountains will drip with sweet wine so that is one way of understanding that as, as the first sign here's the beginning of the messianic age in a sense uh with the with the feeding of the 5000 and the bread and the the giving of bread and fish i think we we highlight the fish or the the bread i mean and we leave out the fish because jesus doesn't call himself the fish the fish of god right <laughs> and the bread of heaven the fish um, of life yeah <laughs> yeah the fish of life uh but they, that's part of that um and I, and i that that whole passage is set in a wilderness context mm-hmm. right the, it's contrasted with moses and, and the manna in the wilderness mm-hmm. and so we see um we see the way in which jesus and well god really through jesus provides this other bread from heaven bread that will last mm-hmm. and um and so that also has this this old testament context because you see it in the way that jesus the jews grumble in 641 Mm -hmm. and then in other places the the grumbling is a theme of the people of israel in the old testament in the wilderness right they're constantly Mm -hmm. grumbling you we we should have stayed in egypt we should have done this and so but there's there's disagreement with what jesus is saying in in these contexts about um about himself as the bread as and also being from heaven Hmm. so the fact that he's the bread from heaven is disputed and then also the fact that he is you need to eat that bread Mm -hmm. that also is disputed creates another issue but i got a little sidetrack there because the other the other uh the other (laughs) sign nature sign is the walking on water right which katrin williams and others have shown has this connection to the idea of some of the psalms that mm-hmm. talk about the the Red Sea being divided and the people of Israel going across, talk about God's footsteps on the water mm. in the in the preparation of that. And so some scholars uh, have seen that in Jesus walking on water, in some ways it's a fulfillment or carrying on of this this mm. walking of God or God's footsteps on the water uh, in the way that he redeemed his people from Egypt. And so here, Jesus, it, it creates this, this is also something in John's gospel that's different from the synoptics in the way that Jesus is very closely associated with the Father. Right. I and the Father are one, right? Yeah. So the signs in some way point to that oneness, at least like the walking on water is one of those. Okay. Uh, that, where where, where Jesus is doing things that are credited to Yahweh in the Old Testament, basically? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And and you see that too in the raising of Lazarus, mm. because in John five, Jesus Jesus talks about how he only does what the Father has shown him, mm-hmm. and the and this is in five um, five twenty one. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also mm. the Son gives life to whom He will. Oh yeah. So the Son has the authority to give life because the Father has granted that to Him. But he also has the authority to judge, which is, comes in the next line. The mm-hmm. life and giving life and giving judgment are two aspects of of the Lord that the scriptures of Israel talk about as being key key features of who God is. Okay, I got a question about the water and the wine one. That that one's always tripped me up yeah. because it seems. Like why? Like it doesn't seem like a big deal. Like if I think like <laughs> walking on water or feeding five thousand, I guess the men, right? Um, not including women and children, or or raising Lazarus from the dead, and then Andy turned water to wine. It's like, well, I I like a good glass of wine too. But I mean, like, what is? It just seems kind of like why 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 that? Like, <laughs> and, and I know why. Okay, so wine it, is there is there some kind of illusion with like it's at a wedding and the wedding is kind of looking forward to, I don't know, like revelation 19 kind of stuff, you know, the marriage supper of the lamb, or is there, you know, wine is a symbol of uh, blessing and new creation. Like in, you know, the, in the minor prophets, they often talk about, you know, wine flowing from, or what, what did, uh, in dumb and dumber <laughs> where, where beer flows like wine. <laughs> 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 I yeah. think Amos says something like, you know, wine will flow from the mountaintop or something like that. So, 
So I, I get, you know, there's some of the symbolism, but it just, it seems a little like mundane. Uh, is it supposed to be that or? Uh, I don't know if it's supposed to be mundane. I, I think it is something. I mean, it's, it's, it's spectacular because at the end, at the end of it, uh, his, his disciples, uh, he reveals his glory to his disciples and they believe in him. But this, what's interesting to me about if you read I, it's one. This is one of those passages where those of us who are familiar with the Bible, we sort of gloss over the details as we read it, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you read this very closely about to what's happening, nobody really knows this miracle happens except for the servants and then right. clearly the disciples and and Jesus' mother. There's very few people. Like the the groom has no clue where this wine came from. Mm-hmm. The, the person who the wine is taken to, the, the, the head of the feast, has no clue where this has come from. And I'm sure the guests have no idea. Maybe there's a rumor that's spread around. But it's this is not a, a sign that everyone sees. Mm-hmm. It's only for a few. But I, I do think that the significance of the wedding, the celebratory aspect, and mm-hmm. the way that wine functions in, in the Minor Prophets... Okay. Uh, in these descriptions of the age to come, when God yeah. is going to redeem His people, I, I think the wine is is indicative of that. In, okay. In the way that it's starting out here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, because because the the text does say right, this was the first of His signs. Right. 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 This yeah. is the first. This is the the introduction to to what Jesus, who Jesus is going to sh- be shown to be. Okay. However, in at the end of like the section right before this. Jesus is called numerous names, right? He's already been called the Word of God. John the Baptist refers to him as the Lamb of God. You have Andrew coming to Peter and saying, we found the Messiah. Philip going to Nathaniel saying, we have found the one of whom mm-hmm. Moses and the prophets wrote. And then you also have Jesus himself at the end of uh, John 1, 51, referring to himself as the Son of Man. Mm-hmm. So you have these multiple descriptions of who Jesus is by okay. title phrase and then you have this first action okay what so, why did sorry go ahead yeah no. just to answer your question the wine is is i think this open opening celebratory okay. revelatory aspect of, of who jesus is why did he make so much wine i mean eat, so, so eats verse six six stone water jars holding 20 to 30 gallons each that, that so we're talking 150 to 180 gallons of wine if there's like 150 people at the wedding that's like a gallon per person <laughs> or is that is that is that intentional again I'm, I'm trying to distinguish between right somebody could say well that's just these are the facts of what happened but we know i mean i i just i'm always like yeah but john there's many other facts you could read but he's he's he's, he's i don't want to read too much in this stuff but i don't want to read not enough too like there's usually a point for every detail that's you know um noted so is it the abundance of god's New creation blessing, or that's a lot of wine. My God. Yeah, it, I mean, part of it could be the abundance. There's also the fact that these weddings, these, this was not just a six hour thing on a Saturday night, a reception on a Saturday night. These were week long oh, village okay. festivals, right? And and Jesus has come from outside the village, so there's more people than just the villagers here in in the village. So it's it's probably okay. like a it's a regional party of these smaller towns probably coming together so whether or not this was early in that week-long festival where every evening they would have a celebration to celebrate the wedding okay um but it is it is a lot of wine Mm -hmm. which leads me to the the catch of fish at the end of john okay because there's a reference to 153 fish right right which going there's been so many opinions as to whether that means something right yeah, uh, Augustine had his like he counted out like it means this, it represents this. Um, I personally just think that's a lot of fish. Okay, and if you have someone who's who's a fisherman, like there were 153 fish in the net. <laughs> so there's <laughs> there's no significance to the number other than that it's just a lot of fish. That's what I think. Yeah, but uh, there's plenty of people who thought that there's some other sort of significance to it. But I think I maybe for us, when we, when we think about industrial fishing, that's not very much. But yeah. if you're out with your rod and your, your that's lure, a yeah. that's a lot of fish, <laughs> right? 
even if yeah. even if you're dealing with you know nets like smaller nets that you're hand tossing into the into the sea mm -hmm. pulling up i think that's still a lot of fish yeah i remember mark and i fellow phd student of ours when we were there um i still remember that now that you mentioned i, I still remember him saying this is this the passage of 153 fish is evidence that not every single number has some sort of symbolic meaning behind it because this one just kind of doesn't it's just 153 fish. I, I know i'm sure some people have argued that it right. does but it's just these, yeah, it it's just a historical detail fish. 144 <laughs> fish would create, would right, create right, a different right. argument right? 120 fish or you know, yeah yeah totally um 144 <laughs> Yeah, 153 doesn't seem significant other than it's a big catch. This episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens, now called AG1. AG1 is an incredible nutrition supplement. I've been taking it for over a year now, and I can truly notice the difference. I have more sustained energy throughout the day. I experience more mental clarity, and I can live with the peace of mind that my body is getting all the nutrients that it needs. Look, there's a lot of good, you know, nutrition supplements out there. There's all kinds of green powders and pills and shakes. And I've actually tried many of them and some of them are quite good. Um, AG1, it's not the only one on the market that's good, but in my experience, having tried many of the other ones, AG1 is the best. It's packed with 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, which just saturates your body with the nutrition that it needs. Uh, AG1 supports your overall gut health, which is super important for your just your overall health. It helps with digestion, improves your immune system, and it actually tastes good. It's not, you know, too sweet, but has just enough flavor to make it go down easy. Like I actually look forward to drinking it in the morning. And that's what I do. I typically wake up and the first thing I do is I, I take my serving of AG1 right before my coffee. Or if I, you know, if I miss my early morning AG1 serving, I'll take it later in the in the morning. Um, sometimes early afternoon and if I'm feeling particularly run down or stressed out or if I'm traveling or didn't sleep well I sometimes take another serving in the late afternoon so if you want to take ownership of your health try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase just go to drinkag1.com forward slash TITR that's drinkag1.com forward slash TITR check it out I, I do want to get to the son of man. Is there, is there, um, cause you, you, you mentioned at the end of chapter one, yeah, I mentioned verse it there. we, we could come back to it because the, the signs kind of end in, in chapter 11. Okay. And, and that, and it's Raymond Brown and others have said that the first part of the gospel is called the book of signs. Yeah. And the last part's called the book of glory. Um, whether or not that's the best way of talking about it, but you only have the signs being talked about up until up through 11. And then chapter 12 sort of serves as this conclusion to Jesus public ministry. Okay. And then after that into 13, you have the farewell discourse running from 13 to 17 with Jesus prayer in John 17, where Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's, that's, some see that as like this inward turn to his internal group at that point. Uh, and so the signs have been public and they're doing what they should, that w what they're intended to do, where some believe and some don't believe. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that phrase, seeing is believing, but that doesn't work in John's gospel. Mm -hmm. Not everyone who sees believes. And the gospel, of course, ends with the statement with Thomas, blessed are those who believe without seeing. So that there's that sense, and and then you have the the crucifixion, and the resurrection events at the end of John, and the the glory, the glory becomes a very key aspect of this. That Jesus glorification, Jesus is glorified through his death and resurrection. That he is. There's another phrase we'll come back to as the Son of Man, the idea of lift, being lifted up, mm -hmm. um, and that whether that's physical or whether that's metaphorical lifting up, hmm. both of them happen through the crucifixion. I think it's more than the crucifixion. That's an ex extended debate among Johannine scholars about what specifically that's referring to. Um, but it's clear that Jesus' crucifixion is part of it, at least. So his death is an exaltation. Okay. His death and resurrection are a glorification. So, uh, there's a, a book by the English translation of uh, York Fry's book, uh, the, the uh, 
Oh, I just really can't forget it. The glor the, the crucifixion of the glorified one or the glorified one. His point in the title is that Jesus, as the one who dies and is raised, is uh, is glorified. His glory is in the death, which is sort of antithetical, not to traditional Christian thinking, but that if you think Luke sort of talks about the way of suffering, mm -hmm. he's on his way to suffer and die, right? But John's gospel talks about his way to exaltation and glorification, mm. which some which is is most likely drawing from Isaiah Isaiah fifty two thirteen, um, which talks in the particularly in the Septuagint and the Greek translation. The uh, yeah, the book, by the way, is uh, The Glory of the Crucified One, Christology and Theology the in the Gospel of John. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, so Isaiah 52, 13 says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely and shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. So in the, in the Greek translation, it uses the same two words that John uses for mm. lifted up and glorified in the mm. Greek translation there. So my servant will be high and lifted up, will be exalted and glorified. Mm -hmm. So that that seems to be where John is probably drawing some of that language from. So, so I'm trying to, so the difference between John and the synoptics, not, not a contradictory difference, but one of maybe emphasis is that John sees glory revealed through the crucifixion, not just like say the resurrection, whereas the other gospel writers would see crucifixion as suffering on the path to revealing his glory through resurrection is that or how would you maybe word it more precisely yeah that might be one way of saying it but like um luke's gospel for example has been talked about as as uh there's a there's a there's a point in luke where jesus sets his face to jerusalem yeah he, he sort of he leaves galilee and he's on his way to jerusalem and there's this long travel narrative where he's moving the, the visit to Jericho with the with Zacchaeus and then on his way to Jerusalem as he's healing people and then he comes into Jerusalem. And this is sort of viewed as this way of suffering because multiple times through that passage mm -hmm. he's talking about, I must go to Jerusalem to suffer. Right? Yeah. John doesn't talk about suffering. John talks about exaltation. So it's a it, again, it's not contradictory. It's the yeah. emphasis. It, the emphasis is different in that for John, the crucifixion and I would say the resurrection and his return to the Father are all viewed under this idea of of glory and um, and exaltation. So the death itself then is not it's not viewed as this. Oh, he's suffering at the hands of sinners and so forth. It's viewed as as this is this thing that has to happen to him that is a, a, glor a an act of glorification by the father. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is there is there a reason for that? I mean, it's hard to get inside the mind of John, but why? Yeah. Yeah. Why? I, well, the I mean, the first to go back to the first sign, right? He begin he reveals his glory mm -hmm. with the sign. Right, so the signs themselves become a revelation of glory, and and the crucifixion and resurrection are an ultimate example of that of that glory. He received like in um, the glory theme is is very closely tied to the Son of Man uh, theme as well, because in John thirteen, when Jesus is in the, just after Judas has left to betray Jesus, in John thirteen thirty one. Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And that's talking about his crucifixion, right? Yeah, that will, or the events that are going to take place beginning with right. the crucifixion. Okay, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are some scholars who would say the exaltation and glorification are the crucifixion only. Okay. So, um, and there are some who would include a little bit more than maybe that, but like Raymond Brown and a few others would say, and I'm, and where I put myself, see this glorification and exaltation as beginning with the crucifixion. So it includes it, 
but it also includes the resurrection and Jesus' return to the Father. Part of, I mean, I don't know if you want me to go into the details of why, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're sort of getting into like 401 here at this point. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in uh, I'll just give the references to them. In um, 222, the disciples don't remember what Jesus says about the temple of my body until mm-hmm. after it says after um, right. that he was raised from the dead. And then in 1216, 1216, after the triumphal entry, we read that the disciples did not understand these things. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that have been written about him. And so for me, if the disciples remember these things after he's raised from the dead and after he's glorified, if those are the same things, that that makes sense. Also. It's very clear the disciples don't have a clue what's going on before the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Right? And even, even right after the resurrection, they're still a little bit lost, right? Until he appears to them. So if these things are not, if it's not until after he's glorified that they have some understanding mm-hmm. of what's happening, then the glorification mm-hmm. needs to include more than just the crucifixion. Okay. Am I reading too much into this? This is. Going back to the wedding, the, the the water and the wine. Um, this is his first sign, uh, two eleven. He displayed his glory with the wine, blood of Christ, crucifixion. Is that? I mean, is is that? Is is John? You know, planting some seeds in our mind here with 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 the wine pointing to the blood, pointing to the glory revelation, or, or is that? I mean that. I, I don't think you'd be alone in thinking that. Okay. So somebody uh, somewhere has once argued that. <laughs> and especially with the yeah, especially with the bread too, right? So right. one of the questions in John six is whether or not the end of that that it's necessary to to eat the flesh of the of the Son of Man, who is the bread of heaven, mm-hmm. is that a sacramental sort of reference? It has to and be, of right? Course, is that debated? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's debated. <laughs> and it, it's interesting, and more not so interesting, that the majority of Catholic scholars hold to it as sacramental. Sure. And those who tend not to think of it as sacramental are mostly Protestant. Yeah, so, shocker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, big shocker. What do you, um, What do you think? I mean, eat my flesh and drink my blood. I mean, first century reader late first century early second century reading that i mean oh yeah and 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 obviously it's it is a a tradition throughout the church to have read this sacramentally because it's it's being read in the context where the sacrament is being given on on a weekly basis right so right. It, it's read in that sort of way real quick can you define when you say read sacramentally like i know yeah, what you're yeah, getting I'll, at but what what exactly are you yeah so so what I mean is by that is that when when someone reads, particularly uh, John six fifty one mm-hmm. through fifty eight, but yeah. John fifty one, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So reading that sacramentally would mean to read this eating of this flesh and this bread as as the Lord's Supper, as the Eucharist, as the in the eating of the bread and the drinking of the wine in the Eucharist, in the in the communion in the Lord's Supper, hmm. that that this is where this is being fulfilled in this context. And that argument for this sacramental reading or this Eucharistic reading, it makes it makes a, a one argument that extends that is that John does not describe the giving of the Lord's Supper at the Passover in in the farewell discourse in John 13 to 17. Jesus Mm. washes the disciples' feet. Whereas in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, take this, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this Mm. cup, which is given for you. This is, in this cup is the new covenant, my blood. John doesn't have that language, but he has this language. Okay. As well as the, the wine. I tend 
to not think that this is sacramental. Oh, I don't yeah. think this is Eucharist, U- Eucharistic. And I, because I understand this in a largely in the wilderness context here, the people raised the question again, as I said before, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Right. So mm-hmm. they're setting this in the context of the manna coming down from <laughs> heaven and the eating. And in that context, the people are both hungry and thirsty. And so here Jesus is providing the the food that provides hunger, that, that satisfies hunger. And and the drinking of his blood there in 653 is also the satisfying of the thirst from the people in the wilderness who wanted water. Wine doesn't satisfy thirst, hmm. right? Water does. Uh, and the blood here, I think, is is connected to that. What are the differences? There, there's a few differences between what we find in in the um, passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where the Lord's Supper is instituted. Is that Jesus says, this is my body, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas here he uses the word flesh. So it's it's a different it's a different term, and there's there's no liturgical use of flesh that I know of where that hmm. where that's happening. So I in my view, I see this as this broader Old Testament sort of fulfillment mm-hmm. in that Jesus is the bread that satisfies. The the comparison here is to the Samaritan woman receiving a living water. Mm, right okay. so she's thirsty she's getting water the the physical water will satisfy for a little bit but the living water satisfies forever mm. right so the the people in uh 634 when jesus says for bread the bread of god is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world and they say sir give us this bread always She's she the Samaritan woman says this to Jesus too in, in chapter four. Oh, yeah. Give us this water always. It's almost the exact same phrase. Oh, wow. Um so that desire or the way in which John Jesus fulfills this desire for thirst, mm-hmm. this desire for food, transcends for me the Eucharistic meal. Because could it include it? I mean, is it could it, it be could include both? it? It could include it, but if you think about this line in 651, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Hmm. Well, the argument Jesus has just given, though, is that manna does not satisfy, right? The water from the well does not satisfy, but this bread from heaven does. But is it in the hmm. physicality of the eating of the bread? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah eating the bread that. of the Eucharist that satisfies forever, or yeah. in whatever the metaphorical sense of eating Jesus is. Okay. Which I think is paralleled with the way the branches in John 15 dwell in the vine. Christ by being, eating, yeah. By eating Jesus, by a branch being in the vine, mm-hmm. all nourishment comes from Him. Okay. Okay. And so that's how eternal life exists. It's not by the physicality of these things. Because Jesus will say in 663, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The Hmm. flesh has no value. But he's just said that we need to eat his flesh. So how does that work? Yeah. That's not his flesh, though, right? That's just, well, yeah. Well, yeah, well, I know. Yeah, I see. It's yeah, no, I, yeah. But it's the, but <laughs> to say that you have to eat the flesh then to have life, but yeah. then to say that the flesh doesn't value. What I'm saying is, is that what Jesus says of eating his flesh, I think he's talking about something beyond the physicality of eating. Okay. And it's not the physicality of the Eucharistic meal that gives the life. But it's the consuming of Jesus mm-hmm. as as who he is in into the life of the believer that provides life. Now, the Eucharistic meal can be representative or symbolic of that, as I speak as a good Protestant. Okay, that's no, that's why I guess that's what right. I was 
Yeah, right? That's yeah, the kind of yeah, both yeah, and so angle so I was looking for. Yeah. But, but so <laughs> in, in Catholic theology, there would be a much tighter connection between yeah. those two. Things, yeah. Right? Okay. I feel, I feel <laughs> I'm like, how could anybody not read this Eucharistically? <laughs> and you just shut me. <laughs> Actually, you don't know what you're talking about. Pauline guy. Just why don't you stick with Paul as I, what I hear you saying? <laughs> well, All right. I mean, again, again, there's a long, um, a long history of both readings. Okay. Going way back in, in Christian tradition. And so, um, yeah, I, I just find this one more convincing. Let's, um, I just want to keep an eye on our time. I don't want to keep you beyond what you committed here. Otherwise I'll have to pay you extra. Uh, let's talk about son of man. So this is something yeah. that, I mean, you did your entire PhD, uh, research on the son of man in, in John's gospel. Um, I guess, let me, let me lead with the way most, I guess the average Christian might be thinking through. We've often were told that, uh, when Jesus calls himself the son of God, that's his divinity, son of man, his humanity. Is that paradigm um, right, wrong, debated? Um, yeah, maybe let's start there and go. we can dive deeper into the role of the son of man in, in John's gospel. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very much debated. Um, it's probably, this is probably one of the most debated New Testament issues. and um, The meaning of the son of man? Yeah, the meaning of the Son of Man. Okay. W what exactly does that mean? And and from I would say from the second century, definitely the third century onward, that division of Son of Man, humanity, Son of God, divinity, was very much ingrained within within Christian. Oh, really? Tradition. Okay. Because I mean, you think about it, you never see any references to Jesus being worshipped as the Son of Man. Hmm. Right. It's it's a it's a reference that disappears. He's he's Lord. He's Christ. He's son of God, but no, no worship of Jesus as son of man, hmm. which again, fits with a sort of idea. Well, if he was understood as a human being, then why would we worship him as a human being? But no, as the, as the divine figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, now the the son of man issue is very complicated. I was grateful to work primarily, at least initially on it in John's gospel, because John's gospel is removed from from most of the other sorts hmm. of questions because the son of man question is very much a historical Jesus question. Um, and John's gospel is not always in this historical Jesus discussions because it's not considered as historical, at okay. least traditionally, because it's so different from the other three. So um, trying to think about how best to frame this, do you go into the one question, do you go into the other? Uh, yeah, why, why don't you, okay, give, give us, yeah, if, uh, say, your youngest kid asks you to explain <laughs> what the, <laughs> I feel like Michael Scott, you know, to dim it down. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, what are some of the big picture issues or debates with, with regard to the Son of Man? You, you can stick yeah, with sure. John's Gospel or as a whole, maybe start as a whole, I guess, probably the best uh, way yeah, to Yeah, my youngest into is it. 10, so... Uh, <laughs> Okay, maybe you're yeah, a middle so, child. <laughs> one of the things about, about the Son of Man is that Jesus refers to himself. He calls himself the Son of Man, but nobody else does. Oh, okay. Nobody else speaks of Jesus, oh, the Son of Man. You do have two instances where his words are repeated by somebody else. Okay. But he, he says it of himself. Uh, but at the same time, nobody seems confused in any of the Gospels by the fact that he's called the Son of Man. They seem to understand what he's talking about. There are, uh, and again, like I said, it sort of disappears from from Christ, early Christian use. Mm -hmm. You you don't have references to him very often at all in the early church fathers mm -hmm. uh, being called son of man. And if they do, it's it's in this completely human sort of reference, this divine mm -hmm. human son of God, son of man sort of. Uh, reference. Son of man without the the in front of it seems to be the way you could have referred to a human being. Okay. Like just as a general human being. A son a son of man is is a human being. Son of Adam, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just like uh C. S. Lewis uses in the in the Chronicles of Narnia, a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve, that those are humanity references. 
So the, the question within the Gospels is, though, you have these different uses of it that suggest that it may not mean more than it may mean more than a son, than a human being, mm-hmm. and that it and some have argued that it's but another that is that son of man is just a, a way you could refer to yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, a, a son of man will do this, mm-hmm. right? And that's sort of a generic way of talking about what a human would be. Mm-hmm. What I found interesting is that that view is very common among British scholars. And if you think about British English, you, you have the, the sort of phrase where, well, one might do this and one might do that, right? Yeah. Where it's like, I might do this and I might do that. I'm sort of talking about myself, but I'm sort of distancing myself from it using the word one. Huh. So that they tend to argue that son of man can be used in, in that sort of way. Now, I think that what complicates this is, is that Daniel, the book of Daniel, in Daniel 7, there's a figure, Daniel has a vision of a figure of one like a son of man, mm-hmm. or one who, a human, human-like human figure in his vision, which is contrasted with beast-like figures. Mm-hmm. And so there's one trajectory of understanding that sees what Jesus is saying in when he calls himself the son of man as referring to that Danielic figure, that, that son of man, that human being figure from Daniel's vision, the son of man. So that's, that's another way of understanding it. And that would see it within the so-called apocalyptic view that, that the way Daniel's figure shows up in say the parables of Enoch or fourth Ezra Mm -hmm. and second Baruch, that, figure is also understood as an individual divine heavenly sort of figure that's associated with messiah and so in my view that's what jesus is doing he's associating himself with that daniel figure mm-hmm. and that's why you have this this the at the beginning of it the, the the son of man phrase doesn't make sense with many of these other references okay now there's does, wait, other, real, real quick does jesus always say the, is he always include the article when he says "Son of Man" when he calls yeah, himself the one, Son of Man? One exception is uh, John five, um, but the article isn't there. But there's a debate about whether or not the grammar of the Greek sentence sort of would not allow for the article to be used. So it's John five twenty seven. That our translations usually translate it with the with the definite article the. Yeah, uh, and he he gave him uh, he gave him authority to uh, to judge because he is the son of man. That seems so, to be right out of Daniel seven, though. That's a whole judgment scene, oh, right? Oh yeah. And the there, father, of the ancient of days, is giving authority to the son of man. I mean, that's that's contextually, it seems whether the article's there or not to be thinking of Daniel seven. Oh yeah, and then when, if you include what happens in five twenty eight and twenty nine after this, do not marvel because the hour is coming. Uh, in which everyone in the in the tombs will hear his voice, and and they will and those um, they will be coming out to uh, th- and those doing good to a resurrection of life, and those who mm. who have uh, practiced evil to a resurrection of judgment, and that is paralleling Daniel twelve two. Yeah. So right after, the, so there's this. Huh. I, I think there's this clear sort of Daniel context here. So the lack of the article may actually purposefully be drawing to okay. that. Um, so let, let me so, sum up real quick, just so, yeah. so, um, son of man, a son of man could referring to like human figure, the son of man seems to be a little different, uh, seems to be linking back to Daniel seven, Daniel seven, very clearly the son of man figure in that vision is an exalted divine figure. I mean, if all we had was Daniel seven, I don't know if we would have full blown Trinity stuff, but you would have this this the son of man who approaches the ancient of days and receives a kingdom is some kind of exalted figure. And in other Jewish, Jewish literature, that's a common way of referring to the future Messiah is he will also be this son of man exalted kind of figure. And you're saying John is kind of participating in that um, interpretation of Daniel seven. Is that a good summary of yeah. yeah, that's a good summary. I would say okay. definitely John is participating in in that interpretive understanding, and um, there you you see in the 
the Greek translation of Daniel 7 and in la these later interpretations that that figure becomes much more divine messianic. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the original Aramaic may not read exactly like that, but you do see, yeah, this coming to the ancient of days, the mm -hmm. kingdom being given, and it's, a, it's an eternal kingdom mm -hmm. is given to this figure. Now, some, uh, like John Collins has argued that this is uh, Michael, the archangel. Oh. That's who the Son of Man figure is, because the, you do have these references in some of Daniel's visions to a human figure that's angelic. But I think that doesn't, it doesn't apply all the way across. And it also has something to, it has to do with the interpretation at the end of Daniel 7 that the saints, the, the mm. people of the saints, the most high and the whole the saint, the holy ones are the holy ones, angels, or are they human beings? Somebody but just told the, me recently that Seventh-day Adventists believe that Michael, the archangel was a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus or something. I don't know if you've heard, is that, but that's interesting. You said, no, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that, but they're, huh. um, Sorry, it I cut probably you off. factors into the angel of the Lord stuff. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In those texts, but yeah, you the, the the original vision contrasts this one this one that looks like a human being. I think that's where some people get hung up on the fact is that it's a vision, right? And the yeah. vision doesn't say this is a human being. It says the figure looked like a human being. Mm. Like when you're trying to describe your dreams. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I was in this place that looked like this, but it wasn't really that place. And then you were there, but then you weren't. And but there was a, somebody that was kind of like this person. So this is like a human being. And then you see someone like the beasts. And the beasts are described as kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. So if the beasts are human kings, mm. it would make sense that the human-like figure is someone who's not human, who's mm -hmm. who's a heavenly figure of some kind. Okay. That seems to be the. I mean, I remember wrestling with you with this at Aberdeen 15 plus years ago. Um, and it just seemed like that, like it, it just seems so clear to me and maybe I'm biased. Maybe, you know, you convinced me so quickly, but um, yeah, I just say, it just seemed like it'd be a harder argument to make to say, no, this, this son of man figure and John is not drawing on Daniel seven. Um, is that Maurice Casey or my former colleague Maurice or is there? Yeah, yeah. That? <laughs> yeah. Casey, Casey and others like uh, Bauckham and Larry Hurtado um, and um, oh, you're going against Richard Bauckham? Yeah, he's just got a new huge Ooh. volume that just came out last month on oh, really? the, just the, the Second Temple Jewish use of the of the term, and I think even going back to Old Testament, I haven't seen it yet. There's supposed to be a second volume that's coming out on the New Testament, but yeah, he argues that it's the phrase "Son of Man" means like someone like me so when jesus uses the phrase he's talking about i'm talking about someone like me but he's sort of talking about himself but it's not necessarily then a, a divine reference and I, I this is where I, i've written somewhere in this uh edited volume on the, the son of man debate in the introduction i talk about how one of the challenges with this phrase is that we don't exactly know what it meant. We don't know how it would be used, right? So Howard Marshall has this example talking about the Son of Man where he says, you know, a king, a king sits on a throne, right? That makes sense. The context makes sense to us, right? Mm -hmm. But if a king plays golf, right, mm -hmm. golf is not associated with kingship necessarily. But in the case of this king, it is. Okay. So if we don't know what the word means, is authority, is judgment, are they part of what it means to be son of man? Or is it, like as Bauckham and Casey would say, it's associated with Jesus claiming himself as a human being, and he himself is a human being, he's the one who has authority and so forth, but not in some sort of role or title as son of man. Okay. So, Man, this gets this gets technical. That's just yeah, so it, for people that aren't familiar with like PhD type oh, yeah. dissertations. This even, is like, well, what are we talking about? <laughs> it's more complicated too when you bring in Aramaic because <laughs> because yeah. that, that's where that's actually where Casey uh, and Bauckham and oh, a lot yeah. of the argument is is about what is that uh, and yeah, Geza Vermesh and others. What does that Aramaic phrase Bar Nash really mean? Yeah, yeah. 
and and was it translated correctly as ha huias antuku the son of man huh. so <laughs> to me <laughs> it just makes more sense that daniel's a connection i mean even mark mark's gospel quotes daniel 7 right in two, oh, two yeah. locations huh. with the son of man phrase so, so in the synoptics is it less debated whether son of man is connected to daniel 7 or is it still the same debate it's still the same debate okay it's still the same debate. John, again, is sort of outside of this conversation. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John's John's question is, the question is more, is it, what's the relationship with the Son of God or Jesus as the Son? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the relationship with glory and the crucifixion? Um, okay. That's that's a bit more of the jo- Johannine conversation is. Okay. Well, we can we can wrap things up, Ben. There's a lot more to talk about. Can you give us a few of your top, uh, your favorite commentaries on on John's Gospel commentaries and or I'm I'm thinking like if somebody wants to study John further, uh, maybe a pastor wants to preach through John. Like, what are some of your top, I guess, commentaries, but also maybe book recommendations that aren't super technical. <laughs> yeah, this is where I always remember. Hope you remember titles. Um, yeah. <laughs> I said. Th- I still find Raymond Brown's two volume maker Bible commentary very helpful. Okay. Uh, it is probably a little bit more detailed than some people need. And he is uh, pretty much given to the, like a community hypothesis sort of setup, but his exegetical notes, I find okay. very helpful. And um, I find myself agreeing with him okay. quite often. Yeah. A, a newer commentary is Marianne by Thompson's oh, yeah. commentary. Um, which is uh, Westminster John Knox, who's the interpretation series. Uh, really accessible commentary, really mm-hmm. useful. Uh, the more practical, too, is uh, Gary Burge in the IBP oh, series, yeah. the application series. That's a that's another commentary that might be a bit more accessible for um, okay. for pastors and, and others. You didn't mention uh, D.A. Carson's. Are you not a Carson fan on John? <laughs> Um, he doesn't listen to podcasts, so you can be honest. <laughs> my my experience, I'll just, my experience with the Carson commentary is is it's um it's very in depth. It gives a lot of information, but there aren't very many footnotes, so <laughs> it's harder to trace where the information is coming from. So okay. as a as a, someone as a scholar, I I want to know where the information okay. or who he's agreeing with and where it's coming from and. And it was, it's harder to trace that. And oftentimes okay. he's very similar to, to there, from what I remember, there's a number of places where he's similar to, to Brown on, oh, okay. on a number, on a number of issues. And so for whatever reason, I think it was during my doctoral thesis, I sort of stopped referring to it uh, as often. Yeah. And then I continued that and I sort of forgot, oh yeah, there's, there's the Carson commentary. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but it's, it's more, that that's more the reason. Okay. Not, um, yeah, but I I use Thompson's Marianne Marianne's commentary in my in my class last time I taught John. Okay. My students students appreciated it. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, your so your latest book is John among the apocalypses. I mean, this is an academic book, right? Um, but your yeah. can you what's the thirty second uh, synopsis of of that book? Uh, the synopsis is, is uh, I compare the Gospel of John to to Jewish apocalypses, so texts like um, the Book of the Watchers or Parables of Enoch and, mm-hmm. and Second Group and texts like that, and argue that John has a similarity with those sorts of genre, that that sort of literature. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, I I pull back and say, but it's not actually an apocalypse. Right. Okay. It, it's a gospel. But I get into some literary conversations and argue that that uh, gospel it's john is a gospel but it's written in what's called an apocalyptic mode so oh, okay. one of the examples that's always given in in these literary conversations is that um jane austen's book emma is a comic novel so mm. john's gospel i argue is an apocalyptic gospel in the sense okay. that it's written as a, as a revelatory gospel in the way that it's framed and so forth okay. so and then the yeah. last the last chapter in the book i talk about uh, John's relationship with Revelation, because I, okay. as I kept talking to people and saying, "Oh, I'm arguing John's apocalyptic gospel," and their first question was, "Well, what about Revelation?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Revelation? Like, oh, I guess I'm gonna have to deal with. It. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I'm, 
Yeah, that, that again, that came out in 2020. I'm working okay. on a, a guide to Second Temple Judaism right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's supposed to be, it's for, it's for students. Oh, right on. Yeah. 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 Is that with Continuum or what's the, they do? No, it's, um, it's with Baker. Oh, cool. Baker, actually. Great. Yeah. So it's, Great. I'm intending it to be short. I want it to be accessible, but then yeah. be able to direct people to other sources if they want, huh. if they want to go deeper on a certain topic. That was a book I was wanting to write out of my PhD and then just fell into other things. So, and now I don't know anything about Second Temple Judaism anymore. <laughs> my, let's just say my yeah. knowledge is rusty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it keep, the field keeps changing. And Does it? Because there's so many scholars now who are, that's their primary area. Yeah. So modern books and articles and things just keep coming out on the topic. Yeah. They're writing commentaries on these texts now. Yeah. Uh, in very series, so it's um, it becomes more and more of something that needs to be people need to be introduced to to because it is the the New Testament is part of that world. Yeah, uh, it is part of Second Temple Judaism, and some Second Temple Judish scholars have come to argue that the New Testament is a Jewish text hmm. since it's about a Jewish Messiah written largely yeah. by Jews. That yeah. that it needs to be thought about in that way. And so it, I think that the time period and the literature of the time period become very important for us for, uh, for understanding biblical so, texts. So rather than reading the second temple Jewish literature as a background of the new Testament, read the new Testament as part of this group of Jewish texts, you know, wrestling exactly. with, yeah. Well, uh, Ben, thanks so much for being on Theology and Raw. I, I enjoyed this. I hope uh, people were able to uh, hang with some of the <laughs> scholarly uh, uh, yeah, sorry we about dug that. into. No, not at all. No, no. My my uh, I am uh, constantly blown away at how widely read a good chunk of my audience is. I mean, they um, – yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I think uh, uh, some, some might have struggled, but I think a lot appreciated the depth. So appreciate you, bro. And uh, let's uh, – are you going to be in San Antonio this fall? I will be, yeah. All right. That's the plan. I will try yeah, to. We got a John, John and John within Judaism session on uh, Monday uh, Monday afternoon. All right on. Around still <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks for being on, thanks for being on the show, bro. All right. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.